Hi everyone, uh, welcome. My name's Rebecca. This is the uh, last talk in series three of the Bead Biosecurity Online Talks. You're joining me here tonight on the very wet and quite chilly Darling Downs. And we've also got on the line with us tonight, Susie, who's helping me uh, with the production, and Hamish, one of our excellent apiary officers here in Queensland, who's gonna help me out with the questions. Now, this is the last talk in series three, um, but we have series four coming back to back onto this series. And so our first talk in series four is going to be on the 4th of May, same time, seven o'clock. And our uh, talk on the 4th of May is going to be a Nasima masterclass. So we're going to be talking about all things Nasima. We're going to uh, also go into a bit of detail for anyone who's interested in doing some uh, monitoring of Nasima at home. If you've got a little microscope at home, you want to have a go. Um, so we're going to do a, a quite a lot of uh, quite interesting things around Nasima. And then the 1st of June, we've got a special guest. So Rod Burke, who is the B Biosecurity Officer for New South Wales, is going to be joining us and he's going to be talking about his specialty subject, which is barrier systems. So if you're a beekeeper, commercial beekeeper with heaps of beehives, or even if you're just a backyard beekeeper with a handful of beehives, having a barrier system in place is really important. And so he's gonna take us through all the different types of barrier systems and how you can implement them at home. Then on the 6th of July, we're going to be talking supplementary feeding, and this one's going to focus on some of the more recent research into what's the op optimal way to supplementary feed, particularly how we can prevent those spread of pests and diseases when we undertake feeding. And on the 3rd of August will be our last in this series, and this is a special one as well because we're going to be talking about how you as a beekeeper can be involved in the hive surveillance program. So this is uh, something that you might hear of in your through your local beekeeping club in the next few months. Um, and it's to allow beekeepers at home to start recording and letting us know what, when they're doing their hive checks and what they're finding. And this is really important because it's important for us to know when and where diseases are occurring. And some of that does happen when you notify us for notifiable pests and diseases. But it's also really important for us to know when you're checking and we don't find anything, because this lets us know how many times we're finding diseases for how many times being checked. So we know a bit of the prevalence then around that. So that's a really important program that we're just getting up and running here in Queensland. And this will be um, a great way for you guys to get involved in that hive surveillance. So that's a really exciting one as well. But let's get on to tonight's talk. And tonight's talk is on swarms and swarming. Now we're a little bit short tonight because I'd very much hoped um, to get out and do some filming of some hives I have here at my parents on the Darling Downs, but the weather has not been to our uh, on our side. And so we're a little bit short tonight, but that's okay. We still have lots to talk about when we come to swarms. So let's start with the real basics. What is swarming? Well, bees form swarms when they're moving from one hive to a new hive, so one location to another. And swarms can, can consist of a queen, several drones, and hundreds to thousands of worker bees, so they can be quite big. Swarming is a natural behaviour of bees, and sometimes when bees swarm, it's the hive splitting, so some bees will stay behind at home and some will leave, and sometimes it's the hive absconding, so all the bees will leave that hive they do it? Why would they go somewhere else? Well, there's a few important reasons. For a start, it's often because the hive is overcrowded. So this is how bees can find a new home and continue to expand this, their colony somewhere else. So there might be too many bees, just not enough space in there. And I'm, I've opened a few hives where I thought, oh, how are those bees ever going to fit back in there? So too many bees or not enough space to fill what they need. So not enough space to store food or not enough space for brood. And when it gets to that point, they then decide, okay, we've got to do something about this. This isn't a good situation. And they'll split and, and form a swarm. There's other reasons that the bees might swarm as well. Sometimes it can be because of a pest or disease in a hive. So if the situation at home in the hive is not good, the bees may think, okay, this is not a good place for us to live anymore. Let's go somewhere else. And that's usually when they abscond. So all the bees will leave. It can sometimes also be because there's insufficient food or water in the area that they are. So bees can only fly so far every day from their hive to collect food and water. And if they're doing that, you know, and not finding enough to keep the hive uh, healthy, then they may have to move. And so 
that's when they may swarm. So there's a few reasons why. When do bees swarm? Well, we find most of the swarming tends to happen in the spring. So this is when they get an influx of food. It's when the bees still have plenty of time over the spring and summer to build up food. If they do split, they move to a new home. So it's a bit of an ideal time. But we do see swarms at other times of the year as well, particularly in northern Queensland. You can find them almost any time of year. But we tend to get another peak in the swarms in the sort of late summer, early autumn, when you might have a build up of food and a build up of brood in the in the um, hive. So they need that extra space and they'll move out. And in terms of the time of day, we tend to find swarming occurs in the warmer part of the day. So around 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. This gives the bees a little bit of time to find somewhere to settle that's a little bit sheltered before evening comes. And where do they go? Well, initially the bees will just kind of land somewhere and sometimes it can be really close to the hive. So it's often places like building eaves, tree branches. Sometimes it's less ideal locations, things like on vehicles or on machinery. And they'll kind of congregate there where they then send out uh, bees, uh, scout bees, to try and find a better new location. So eventually, once those scout bees come back and give the rest of the bees some information about where's good, they'll end up somewhere like a hollow log. They might find an empty hive. Sometimes they go places where we don't really want them to go, into walls or into roofs or other types of cavities. So they'll eventually find somewhere that's a bit more suitable than where they initially landed. Now you may be asking, what about the queen? The hive only has one queen. Where does she go? Does she stay or does she go? Well, she tends to go. So prior to swarming, the worker bees produce what we call queen cells. And you can see some here uh, on this slide. Now the queen cells, um, the worker bees will put, uh, the, sorry, the queen bee will lay an egg in the bottom of those queen cells. And then the worker bees will then um, feed that, that queen in there, potential queen, a very special diet of royal jelly. And this means that she turns into a queen bee rather than into a worker bee. Now, once those queen cells are capped, then swarming tends to occur. So the old queen will then go, okay, I think I've left a good queen here. We can go and they'll fly off. So the old queen leaves with the swarm, leaving those new queens to then hatch. And when they hatch, there's usually more than one, they tend to fight to the death. Um, and I did have a little video here, but it's not working so well. So we put the little video in the question and answer section. You can watch it later. And it's a really fun one because it um, plays the sound that the queen who's just hatched out first goes around making this funny noise, very high pitched type noise. She's calling out the other queen saying, come out and fight me, come out and fight me to the death. And so um, she will go call out the other queens, they'll fight. And then the winning queen will go off on a mating flight. So we'll just skip that one. But here's a couple of queens um, going at fighting to the death. You can see these two have just found each other and they're not having a very good time together. They'll have a bit of a fight and this beekeeper. Once those queens have established who's queen, they'll go off and do that, that mating and come back. So why do you as a beekeeper have to know about swarms? Well, there's a few really important reasons. Firstly, swarms can be somewhat dangerous, particularly in urban areas. You've got a whole bunch of bees in a new location where people might not be familiar with bees. They can get quite upset about having them in there. And if they get disturbed or angry, you can end up with a bit of a problem. So you need to be aware of that as a beekeeper. Swarming can also be important for your hive that's left behind. Sometimes it doesn't go so well in terms of the remaining queen. Um, she might accidentally get killed or um, something happened to her. And this means that you can be queenless. There's less uh, bees in your hive too, of course, once half of them or even more than half have left. So that can leave that hive kind of weak. Less individuals makes it much harder for them to fight off pests and diseases. There are some positive things that um, beekeepers need to be aware of in terms of swarms as well. And one is that is a swarm can increase the size of your apiary. So if you catch a swarm that's come out of your own apiary or someone else's, you can then keep that swarm and have an extra hive. So that's quite nice. Um, but on the downside of that, swarms can also pose a 
pest and disease risk if they are directly introduced into your apiary. Now, as I mentioned earlier, one of the reasons that bees will swarm, will abscond from a hive, is because it's riddled with pests and diseases. And just because they're in the hive and that's often where they're concentrated, doesn't mean that they won't be taken with those bees that are leaving, particularly um, pests and diseases of adult bees, but even things like AFB will be spread by those swarms that are, are moving. So keep that in mind as well as they can pose a real disease risk to your apiary. So let's talk about some of the things you can do around swarms. Firstly, you can try and prevent your hive from swarming. And there's a few things that you can do to try and minimise the chance that your hive will swarm. It still may swarm, but you can decrease that chance. And one is to make sure that they've got that extra space they need. If they've got enough space, they're not as likely to swarm. And some of the ways you can do that is to make sure there's space for food. So either extracting honey or adding on a super when there's little remaining room for storage in that hive. You might also need to um, add some additional brood frames, take out some that are full if, you, if you've had a situation where you've just got too much brood as well. Another thing to keep in mind is destroying queen cells can help suppress the hive from swarming, particularly if you do that very early on when they've just been made. And also, of course, checking your hive for pests and diseases, managing those pests and diseases before before it gets to the point where your bees go, oh, I can't live here anymore, it's too disgusting, I'd have to leave. So what do you do if your hive does swarm? Well, one of the key things to keep in mind if your hive has swarmed is to make sure that you have a queen. Now we've talked about the process through which a new queen comes um, into being in that hive uh, after it's swarmed, but those things don't always go to plan. So uh, particularly when the queen goes out for her mating flight, th this can be a really risky time um, and that queen sometimes doesn't make it back. So you have to make sure that um, your hive doesn't remain queenless for too long. And of course, as I mentioned before, they also fight to the death. And so sometimes they can fight and kill each other. So that can be another way that sometimes the queen is lost from the hive. So how can you ensure that you do have a queen for a start? Um, if you've noticed your hive is warm, have a look for those queen cells, see if you've got some there for a start. And it can take a long time before, um, between when your hive swarms and when you've got an active queen uh, back in the hive. So queen cells will take around six to eight days to hatch. Then the queen will feed for a, a sort of five, anywhere between five and 14 days, depending on the weather. Then she'll go out on a mating flight, which can take up to three days. Then she'll come back, then she'll have a little rest, which can be up to three days again. And so there's quite a, a, a big window between when that hive swarms and when you should see eggs in your hive again. So anywhere between 15 and 28 days after swarming, you should start to see some eggs in your hive. So let's have a look what eggs should look like. You should see these little guys in the bottom of your uh, cells there. And that's what you're looking for. Um, if you can also see a little bit of older brood, uh, sorry, younger brood, that can also be a good indicator. And of course, seeing the queen herself, that's a good sign as well. So look for any of those things. And if you don't find those things, you may need to, to requeen your hive. So I check fairly regularly up until that time period where you think, okay, she definitely should be back. And then um, if she's not, make sure you find a new queen. Now let's move on to the next bit is if you find a swarm, can you put it back if you find it early, if it's just come out of your hive? If you're really, really sure. So um, in particular, if your, um, your hive doesn't look like it swarms, it's still got lots of bees, then I'd be a bit suspicious. Um, if you do, however, see it swarm, and sometimes you can see the bees starting, they'll come around the front of the hive, they'll kind of um, start to mingle and, and form a group around the front of the hive before they uh, leave to a close location, uh, that can be a good indicator as well. If you're pretty sure they've come from the same hive, you can consider putting them back, but I would try and if you can, put them into a new hive, particularly if you aren't 100% sure that it's come out of your hive, largely because of that disease risk. If you've got bees that have come from somewhere else and you're putting them into your healthy hive, you could be contaminating your hive, which we really don't want to do. What if you find a swarm, you're not sure where they've come from? Well, it depends really where you are as well, what you need to do. If you're in the Townsville or the Cairns area, 
These are areas which have had or currently have Asian honeybees. And so you need to report them to the Department of Agriculture and Fisheries call centre. So the same way you report any other of those notifiable diseases or pests, give that call centre a call and let them know. And you still likely are likely to be able to go and collect that swarm if you wanted to, but we need to keep a record of these just in case they're not European bees. Um, if you're in another area in Queensland, then you can go directly to contact someone from a local beekeeping club, um, or if you've got details yourself of beekeepers who collect uh, the hive, then you can contact, uh, sorry, collect swarms, you can contact them. And most beekeeping clubs have a list of people. And if you're really in doubt, um, get on to me and I can uh, put you in contact with someone from one of the clubs. Your other option, of course, is to collect the hive yourself if you're feeling adventurous. So let's talk about how we collect a hive, a collector swarm, sorry. First, you wanna make sure you've got something to put your swarm in when you've got it settled. So prepare a new clean brood box or a nucleus box, but you might also wanna prepare something to collect your bees in. So sometimes rather than trying to lift up a heavy wooden uh, brood box, uh, a cardboard box or even a plastic, big plastic bucket might be more effective. So make sure it's clean and it's ready to go. Always make sure you use protective gear when you go to collect a swarm. Your bees at home might be quite calm and you might be used to dealing with them with a little bit less protective gear, but you really don't know when you go to collect a swarm what you're going to be collecting. So it's strongly advised that you, you put on some protective gear. If you're going straight into your brood box or your new frame, make sure you've got those uh, four middle frames uh, removed so that there's somewhere for the bees to the bulk of the bees to go to start with and you can put those back later. Uh, another tip is to uh, if you're going into a box to put a big light coloured sheet underneath it as well underneath this where the swarm's going to be collected and that way if the bees don't fall in your box they fall on the ground you can more easily collect them up and be able to see where they are. And so once you've got your components ready you can then shake or relocate the bees into a box. Let's have a look at a couple of different ways that you might go about this. Is on a branch where you can just give it a bit of a shake and then most of the bees can fall in. So you can see an example here, this guy's just gonna give it a bit of a shake and there they go. Most of the bees will then fall into the box and you can then collect the remaining ones. If your bees are on the ground, what you can do is put some lemongrass oil inside a box like this, and that attracts the bees in. And once the most of them have been attracted in there, particularly the queen, then you can go about um, getting the rest of the bees that, that they'll follow that queen in there. And again, um, if your uh, swarm is up on a branch, you can actually cut that branch off if it's a small one, and that can make it much easier to then relocate those bees into the bucket or box that you're going to move them to where you're going to put them into a brood or new box finally. And finally, sometimes they're not in the greatest location. So here's someone in the back of the car and this uh, beekeeper is just giving them a bit of a swipe to make them fall in. I'd recommend sometimes it's better maybe to have a brush, a bee brush. And before you start doing this, if you have a spray bottle with um, a bit of water, give them a light spraying and this can kind of calm them down and make them easier to collect. So the queen is likely to be in the middle of the swarm and you want to make sure that you get her. So the bees are going to congregate around the queen and that's a good way to know, okay, if I've got the middle of the swarm and I've got the bulk of it, likely I've got the queen. But then you want to watch. Once you put that in the box and you're pretty sure she's in there, see where the bees are going. If they're not going towards where you think the queen is, you might not have got the queen, so have a bit more of a look. Once you put the bulk of the bees in, place a, a lid or a, some kind of, um, sometimes a, a bit of a grill or a grate instead can be better if it's a hot day on the top of the box. And that just allows a bit more uh, ventilation in there because you don't want these bees getting too hot. Ensure there's an opening so that the remaining bees can get in there and they may continue to return until up until nightfall. So if you can leave it there for a while and collect all those bees that are still coming, that'll mean that you get as much of that swarm as possible. 
make sure you've got plenty of ventilation if you're transporting them within that box um, to the new location, as well as it's being sealed up nicely. So seal up once it's starting to get a bit dark, make sure though that there's enough ventilation in there so the holes are very small, the bees can't get out, but you can get air coming in. Um, if you need to move them away from where you're collecting them, you've got a couple of options. So go either slowly, a few metres a day, or go much further on one lot. So more than five kilometres you can go in one lot. So either of those two ones. Otherwise the bees get a little bit turpsy-turvy about where they uh, go and where to get back to their hive. So if you move it, say 100 metres at a time, often they won't be able to find their way home. So short distances every day, or a long distance all at once. And if you can leave it until the morning before you open up the hive and let them come out into their new uh, surroundings, that's uh, a little bit more advantageous as well. So once you've collected your swarm and you put it where you're going to um, keep it for the next little while, give it at least a week to settle before you go and have another check. And of course, what you want to look in there for is uh, have you got a queen? If you do, excellent. Um, if you can't find a check, if there's eggs, that might be a sign that there is a queen in there. And if you've got no sign of a laying queen at that point in time, you may want to consider requeening because it could be that you just don't didn't collect the queen and you still may be able to save that swarm if you add a new one in. So once you have the swarm, keep them away from other bees in your apiary, keep them away from your other hives. Now we do this because we don't want any diseases or pests that that swarm has to be introduced into your apiary. So remember we said earlier again that often bees swarm because of pests and diseases. So we don't want that situation to be introduced into your apiary. It could be that they're fine and they're clean, but we just don't know at that point in time. What you can do though, to ensure that uh, you're not spreading those diseases in and you can eventually integrate your bees, is first up, you can do a sugar shaker and alcohol wash. So, you know, even in that one week after collecting them, when you go to check, you can do one of those and look for mites. So that's uh, um, important. Then you can do regular inspections. So I would say, you know, you might start to see signs of AFB anywhere up to six weeks after you have put them established a new hive, but it could be even longer. And if it was me, I wouldn't be integrating them maybe even up to six months after you collect them because you just, sometimes it can take a while for things like AFB to start to show up in your bees. So keep looking for those signs of diseases. And in the meantime, um, how we separate the hives from your, you know, one hive in your apiary is firstly, uh, distance wise, put it as far as you can from your hive. So I know this can be difficult for uh, beekeepers who are just hobbyist beekeepers keeping a, a beehive in their backyard. In that case, just do it as far as you can. Um, if you have a bit more scope, um, it's better to take it, you know, a, a reasonable distance. So if you can take it five, six kilometres away from your other hives, that way you're minimising any risk that those bees are going to be mingling and sharing pests and diseases. You also want to uh, separate them in terms of what equipment that you use on those hives. So if you can have a separate set of gloves and a separate, particularly a hive tool, so that you're not mixing those pieces of equipment that can be contaminated between your hives. So those are important once you have that swarm collected, that you keep it separate from the rest of your apiary. So, um, those are the key points in terms of swarms and swarmings. We might move on now um, to some questions this stuff this evening. Um, have we got any questions coming in? And while I'm waiting for my questions to um, come up, uh, Hamish, do you have anything to add about swarms and swarming? I'm sure you've collected a few swarms in your time. Oh, thanks, Rebecca. Oh, thanks, Rebecca. Um, you've covered it quite well, only um, one thing that comes to mind is sometimes you can um, uh, be in a situation where the bees just um, will just want to swarm no matter what you do with them uh, in terms of management, you know, such as reducing the, uh, the population and giving them space and those sort of things. Sometimes uh, there's just such an abundance of food, it's hard to keep up that uh, management process. So 
I guess uh, you can find yourself in that situation, so you've just got to make the most of um, trying to capture them and uh, uh, seeing if they'll stay. It's mainly, you know, on really heavy honey flows, perhaps out west, um, where I've seen it. Yeah, and I guess that's the thing. Um, it's a it's a natural ingrained behaviour in your bees, and so they're going to sometimes want to swarm um, if situation looks right for them to do it, no matter what the you know what you've done for them. So, yeah, I guess being aware of that is is pretty important. Yeah. Um, looks like we're not quite any questions this evening. I guess a lot of people are still away on holidays. Um, hopefully, uh, we will uh, be. Uh, able to show you some footage um, from my hives here in our next set of videos if our weather clears up. Um, I'd like to um, show you a little bit each time and show you how these uh, new hives that I've just set up are establishing over time and what to be looking for each time we open the hive. So it's um, really important as a beekeeper to look in your hive regularly, not just to look for problems, but to get to know what a healthy, normal hive looks like. So learning yourself what, what what we should see and so hopefully that little series of videos that we'll show in the upcoming talks um, will be a nice addition to help people get familiar with what their hive should look look like and every hive is a little bit different but um, knowing your own hive is, is, is one of those key processes. So if we don't have any other questions, do um, you have any further add this evening Hamish? Not really. Thanks, Rebecca. Um, you know, swarming is one of those things that uh, the more times you do it, you do get a sense of how the bees um, respond and, um, and act, and you get a real feel for um, what you can and can't do with them. And usually they're well behaved because they've got a full belly of honey, and usually you can um, uh, coax them into something. But um, in the swarms that I've collected, e you know, each one has probably been unique. So there's never been, you know, uh, um, exactly the same scenario uh, arrive, so to speak. So they've been all different sorts of um, uh, places where they've landed, um, both, you know, locally and also on on items or bushes. So um, so you really just have to. Um, and, and often also you, you're taken um, by surprise. So probably a good piece of advice is to have things ready on hand um, so you can grab them at the time because uh, uh, it can surprise you. <laughs> yes, and I guess um, to keep in mind as well, if you're uh, not collecting bees yourself, but you'd like someone else to come and collect a, a swarm that you've come across, many of the beekeepers that are on the swarm collecting list these people um, have other jobs as well, and um, they're not just waiting by the phone to come and collect swarms. So they often do the best they can to come out and, and to collect swarms uh, when they get the call. But keep in mind that they may not always be able to, to come straight away and collect the swarm, and it may move on before they're able to come. So they do do their best, but that's something to, to consider as well. Well, um, looks like we're pretty quiet tonight. We'll finish nice and early and I'm going to go and um, tuck into some of my remaining Easter eggs. I'll see everyone in a month's time and um, I hope you all enjoy uh, this little stint of rain that we're having. I'll see you next time. <laughs>